Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for stopping by. My name is Mandy Drury. I'm an anchor with CNBC. It's actually a really important topic that we're going to be discussing this evening, so I am very, very glad that you have come here. And of course, there will be time for your questions as well. We'll make sure we get them to our panelists. So let me just put the, um, the topic into context here, because I think that actually reporting on sustainability has been something that, gosh, it's been done for decades, but it's often been done on a voluntary basis. That is all changing now, isn't it? It's now not just a nice to do, it's a must do. Essentially, capital markets are integrating these mandatory sustainability disclosures um, with the premise as well that hopefully it's good for maximizing company returns. But as we all know, we all operate businesses, we all operate within businesses. It's a real trade-off, isn't it? It's sort of on one side, you've got to ba balance the, the good sustainable practice and all the onerous reporting that goes along with that. On the other side, you need to make sure that you can also maximize financial performance. So how do we make it count? That's the topic we're talking about today. It's how can we move beyond the burden of proof of reporting and provide more capacity for concrete sustainable outcomes? And we've got a really fantastic uh, lineup of people here to talk about it. In fact, uh, some of the best uh, minds on the subject. Let me introduce them to you. We have here, uh, sitting at the end there, Emmanuel Faber, who thank goodness came along we thought for a second there that he was not going to join us. Just in the nick of time, uh, he's the chair, International Sustainability Standards Board, IFRS. We also have, uh, joining us this evening, Bonnie Chan Yiting, the COO and incoming CEO of the Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing. So thank you very much for your time as well. We have Peter Reinhardt, who is the co-founder and CEO of Charm Industrial USA. And sitting next to me here, Carmine de Sibio, the global chairman and CEO EY International Business Council and EY also was involved in uh, developing the new standards with the ISSB. So thank you very much all of you for joining us and as I mentioned I will open it to the audience um, so be ready with your questions. You can also follow along on social media and uh, use the hashtag WIF24. So let me get straight to it. Carmine, first of all let me get to you. Why is it so important to have a globally unified voice here of the private sector to make sure that there is a consistent global system for sustainability disclosures and how would you rate the progress so far? Okay, so, so let me try to level set this topic because we obviously don't have a global unified voice. Uh, the whole issue is fragmented, but, but uh, you know, it's incredibly important that we understand where we are and where we're trying to get to, and uh, I'll get to the ISSB, with, sure. uh, obviously with Emmanuel here. Um, so, you know, like financial reporting in general uh, and accounting standards, you know, there's basically two or three accounting standards that float around today, uh, including IFRS and US GAAP. Um, and so we started down the line of trying to, we meaning the big four, trying to work with standard setters to be as consistent as possible. What we did do, working with the International Business Council uh, under the leadership of Brian Moynihan, uh, the big four and Brian Moynihan uh, came up with, at the time, general ESG metrics. Um, and this spanned four different categories. Climate was one of them. And we wanted to do this, and this was on a voluntary basis. We said if we can get big companies, companies that are part of the International Business Council, to voluntarily disclose these metrics, um, you know, then that would be a start. And it would be a start to get the whole world unified in terms of consistency on some of these metrics. So we did do that. We all worked together. The big four, usually are competing with one another, worked together. We all had a different uh, part of the project. We worked with Brian. And then we did get, and we're up to over 200 companies that committed to these disclosures. Mm -hmm. So we felt that that was a great start, and it was thanks to the International Business Council and the World Economic Forum to, to try to drive some consistency as the standard setters got into this more um, as we went along. What became clear early on was that the, the EU was a bit ahead uh, and moving faster, certainly than the SEC. But what we really, all the big four, what we were really supportive of is the ISSB. And we have big thanks to Emmanuel for everything he's doing there, um, because we thought that that would be the building blocks and the standards that, that countries would adopt and regulators would adopt around the world and really use those so we would have some kind of consistency. 
That has worked okay. Standards are coming, but the EU moved further ahead, and the SEC still doesn't have any standards. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we thought we can be more consistent on, um, I think a lot of our clients, for example, are not happy in terms of the consistency. But um, they are in favor of the ISSB and the standards that have been developed in the ISSB. The, the um, conceptually, you know, some of this has to come together, and we're hoping that even the SEC, when, when they do come out with standards, are more consistent with the ISSB and consistent with the EU. But that's still to come. Mm -hmm. So let's get to Emmanuel then on what the ISSB is doing on this front because you've essentially brought together what we call the alphabet soup of various standards and, and you've released last year um, two standards, one for general reporting on sustainability, one for climate, which actually the Australian government has taken up. Do you feel that you've made excellent progress in trying to set that global baseline um, for market regulators and also companies to be able to adopt? Well, th thank you, Jory. I, I think we made good progress. I wouldn't say excellent. Okay. Um, the, uh, the speed at which and the momentum and the process through which uh, those uh, standards were built, I think was quite unparalleled. Um, and you know, we delivered in about 18 months including a very, very important topic for us, which was the endorsement by IOSCO, the International Organization of Securities Commissions. The, the whole board of IOSCO um, um, found that uh, our standards are fit for purpose, and IOSCO is a membership organization that covers 135 different uh, uh, jurisdictions in the world, covering 95% of, uh, of, of the market capitalization. The last time they had endorsed standards was 20 years ago for the IFRS standards. So it's, it's, it's really a super important step that was covered last, uh, last summer. Our standards are now effective um, January 1st this year, so any company, any regulator can uh, use them. We are now engaging with probably 20 jurisdictions really, really, really deep into the assessment of the standards. Um, they represent roughly 50% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. So I'd say it's a pretty good start for standards that are just at the very, very mm. early part of the, the life. Um, that includes some of them that I can mention because they mentioned, uh, you know, so the UK mentioned they would use our standards uh, very early on. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Japan uh, um, regulators said by 25 they will be mandatory based on S1 and S2. They are going to consult later this year uh, about it. Korea is still going into uh, the question of their calendar, but it said Hong Kong, of course, and thanks to Bonnie and her colleagues, um, you know, are there with climate very soon. She will probably speak about this later. Singapore said 25, Malaysia is consulting, Taiwan is on as well. Uh, Brazil uh, said mandatory by 26, permitted next year, mandatory by 26. Turkey said 24, Nigeria, Ghana, others, we, you know, so these large countries are there. Uh, and we are now interoperable with Europe, which of course is not the ideal world in which we would have liked to be, but it means that ISSB can be a passport for international preparers into the European system, and you can also export the uh, European system into the ISSB with a navigation tool which is currently finalized jointly with, mm. uh, with the EU. So that's where we are, which is really that's the launch phase, and I think the momentum needs to be maintained in order to ensure that we do not come from a situation where the alphabet soup you mentioned was basically voluntary to what could be a mandatory uh, regulatory uh, alphabet soup if we do not succeed in establishing that global baseline that Carmen was uh, talking about. Okay, so still a lot of work to be yeah, done. You've, you've set us on the path and you're also working against jurisdictional fragmentation as well. May I ask though, is there still a schism in the reporting world in the sense that sort of the ISSB is focused on single materiality, whereas the EU is still focused on path of, of double materiality, so financial value, value creation plus focusing on other things like, you know, doing good for society. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you see as a problem? No. No. I don't think so. I mean, we've, we are really of the view that you can actually do both in the condition you do it clearly, mm -hmm. which is 
we establish a global baseline which is entirely on investor materiality, yes. which is going to drive the banking system, the financing system, the capital markets. And by the way, the Basel Committee is working with our standards now for their future work. The international public sector accounting standard boards is working with our standards. So they are going to be systemic rich. And, but it's, they are totally made for jurisdictions to add whatever else they want to add as building blocks above that global baseline. Mm -hmm. So the case of Europe is specific because they started before we existed. They, they, they couldn't have taken care of us because they started. And hence this very peculiar agreement of interoperability that I just described, which I think is something and has to be of the past, because the next stage is really to have that global baseline and everybody that wants to go beyond that can of course do this on the global baseline. So trying to provide clarity for the capital markets, which brings me to you then, Bonnie, because um, the HKEX is essentially um, a regulator as well as, as well as an exchange. So how would you benefit from a globally unified system? Yeah, I think absolutely the global baseline that Emmanuel just um, mention is it's very important. So in the case of HKEX, we have multiple roles. We are a listed company ourselves, right? So we have our own corporate sustainability journey. Uh, but on top of it, we are an exchange operator and um, a market regulator. And I think for the purpose of this conversation, our role as a market regulator is it's the most relevant. So the journey actually started 10 years ago, 2013, right? We have uh, um, 2,600 companies listed on our exchange. So the, the, the mission is to bring all of them on the journey uh, for the climate disclosure. It has to start 10 years ago because you know you cannot really just, just do it in mm -hmm. a, you know, sort of one full sweep. You have to sort of bring them onto the journey. And by the way, when we started, there wasn't the global baseline. No, it's still being developed, you know, as Carmine and Emmanuel uh, mentioned. So what we started was a humble step. We started with saying, okay, all companies listed on our exchange, you need to now think about ESG in general terms. And then um, a, three, a few years later, we sort of make another step and say, okay, now it's mandatory to have an ESG report on an annual basis, you know, where you talk about general stuff, and it's ESG, it's not climate specific yet. Then uh, TCFD framework, you know, came, came along and we embedded, you know, in the uh, ESG uh, report, reporting framework. And eventually, after 10 years, we reach a point where we felt you know, as the uh, global baseline has emerged, we, we felt brave enough to consult on making climate disclosure mandatory. So our consultation, uh, public consultation paper came out in April uh, 2023. It was difficult, you know, I have to admit it, because, you know, with the 2,600 companies, there are big ones, you know, very well resourced. They probably already have in-house experts who can help them navigate, you know, the, the alphabet soup, all right? Mm -hmm. But you have small cap companies sure, and they're like, okay, all right, you know, why am I doing it, right? And you do a lot of market education explaining why this is important and investors are going to demand it anyways, you know, and if you do not have the climate disclosure, then eventually, you know, I mean, fund managers cannot deploy capital and you're going to lose out, right? So a very long phase of education. Then eventually they, they, they got to a point of, acceptance, okay, we have to do it. Um, many of them still see it as compliance cost rather than, you know, something which will give them sort of positive benefits. Uh, and then they come to us and say, well, look, but, you know, even if I'm willing to spend the money, right, wh where do I find the, the consultants and the advisors who are going to help me on this journey, right? I, I I think you raise an absolutely excellent point because essentially you've got these companies who now have to have, if not an internal team of people with a whole new set of skills to be able to do the reporting, the auditing, the risk strategy, the business strategy, to be able to do the reporting. And you also at the same time as a company have to be actually transitioning exactly. to be able to have something to report. It's going to be a bonanza for external <laughs> auditors know, and know. accountants <laughs> like you, Carmine. I mean, I, I ask you how big is you, team do is. you have the 
at EY and the big four, do you have the cap capacity and capability amongst so, your people to be able to do all of this? Right, so, so obviously it's an issue and we would like to have more capacity. So what yeah. we've been doing and, and the other big four have been doing, we've actually been working with universities around the world um, and making sure that they embed some of this training in the universities. So a lot of accounting majors in universities today, they, they, they are being taught, and this is just starting, uh, you know, carbon. They're being taught how to account for carbon, what it means, the science behind it, all that. We actually think it's, it's a way to revitalize a lot of the accounting uh, schools uh, because, because young people are really interested in the subject. So I personally have been involved at a few schools in the U.S. on making sure that they're changing their accounting program mm. to include carbon, to include sustainability, uh, reporting, uh, carbon pricing, which we can get into. So, so some of them have been very proactive and have actually put, put these classes in place. So obviously we're, we're hiring more people with those skill sets and we're, we're obviously training our own people. With all that being said, there's a scarcity of resources. It's a yep. new topic. Um, but yes, it is. And, and this is where we get caught in a tough spot because because some of our clients would say, see, this is big business for you. You wanted it to be more complicated, you know, and so forth. We really don't. I mean, we wanted to keep, and they all know, we wanted to keep this and try to make it as simple as possible. But unfortunately, we're not there. Well, let me come to you, Peter, because companies are coming to you to be able to manage their carbon and explain exactly what that means and how this all dovetails into the sustainability theme. Yeah, and I come at this from a very different perspective. And yeah. I'm an operator who sells mm -hmm. carbon removal to large corporations who are trying to mitigate their, their emissions and get to a net zero uh, place. And, you know, I think we really sell to the companies who are at the sort of cutting edge, primarily in the United States. They have large ESG reports. They have done a huge amount of work on reductions, and now they're getting around to uh, driving, driving some reductions. And so I guess I view this from a very different perspective, which is a set of companies who already have, have maybe not standardized, but have effective climate disclosures. Uh, and where we are trying to operate is at a much more detailed level of how do we actually physically account in a very detailed way for the carbon that we're putting underground. And the questions, just to give one example, the questions get very weedy very fast, uh, as they do in the financial accounting world. Mm -hmm. For example, if you have a truck that goes from point A to point B, how much emission, how much was emitted? You can estimate that based on the truck, but did you have to also account for the truck positioning to point A? What about positioning from point B to the next ride? And that's all things that are, require some sort of philosophy, accounting philosophy for how you address, and generally speaking, are not available from the suppliers downstream. And so there's lots of challenges in actually implementing uh, these things, and the level of detail required, I think, to actually go implement that level of, of detailed tracking is, is quite challenging to come by. And so what happens in practice is, at least in these you know, jurisdictions that don't yet have, have a standard, is people just look at their spend, they categorize the spend, and they have an estimate on that spend and it, and it spits out a number. Incredible, and, and I believe that you've also launched sort of a, I think in your words, a painfully rigorous accounting protocol to be able to measure all of this. Does that at all jibe with what is going on with the ISSB standards? Or is this once again sort of different accounting standards that we're looking at, another alphabet soup? Maybe I should explain what we do. So Please we, do. we take carbon dioxide into plants, we turn the plants into barbecue sauce, and then we inject the barbecue sauce into old <laughs> oil and gas wells. And this is a carbon removal pathway. Uh, this is, our goal is to basically set the high watermark for what good measurement, reporting, verification, trust, and transparency looks like. That's what our customers want, is the highest quality. And yeah, that requires going, going very in the weeds. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we partnered with a new registry named Isometric. Uh, that has a fundamentally different incentive, which I think is very important, and we just rolled out like a 50 or 60 page uh, accounting protocol for how we're gonna, how we're gonna measure this, uh, and after this year it will be verified. Uh, I think it's, it's ISO compliant, but uh, I actually have no idea if it's compliant with ISSB, so mm -hmm. we'll, have to, we'll have to look into that. Um, I think one of the most interesting things historically is if you look at where people have been doing a lot of carbon accounting around offsets uh, or, or removals is the auditors that were effectively stamping those things had a really messed up incentive, which is why I think you've seen such huge problems in the offset market over the last few years, uh, scandal after scandal after scandal in, in the press, which is they were effectively only paid when a carbon credit got sold, which means, like imagine if EY only got paid when they gave a green stamp to a financial audit. That'd be crazy, mm. but that's how it worked. 
And so we really need like a fundamentally different incentive system in the registries that provide the stamp and the auditors there to, to also clean up and ensure that there aren't shady things happening that are going into these disclosures. Absolutely. It's, in, it's incredibly exciting innovation. So let me get to you then, Emmanuel, and going back to something that Bonnie said about the, the capacity and capability of companies to be able to absorb these new standards. When you were developing them, did you have that in mind of, you know, okay, here I am developing them and they're great and it's, it's wonderful to be able to set a baseline, but is it going to be able to be actually implemented? by companies and regulators around the world? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a super critical question, of course. Yes. The answer is yes. And there are some building things that I can very briefly share about. The independent board that uh, we are, 14 members from Asia, uh, Africa, American continent, Europe, um, we are full-time independent for three, four, and five years mandate staggered. So we are full-time people. The people that are around the table comes from BlackRock, KKR, CalPERS, GPIF, which is the government of Japan, largest asset owner in the world, investing for 100 years as mandate. On the other side, the chair and CEO and CFO of Danone for 20 years, signing accounts, preparing accounts, actually preparing on scope three for 15 years, releasing an EPS adjusted, uh, carbon adjusted, which was saluted by um, Doug Peterson, the CEO of S&P, when we did that. So do I know that it can be done? I think the answer is yes. Mm -hmm. The chief business performance of Siemens, the CEO of Metro, the CEO and chief sustainability officer of Dangote, multinational company, 40 different countries in Africa. So these are the people with the best standard setting people of the IFRS Foundation, a few academics, the vice president and uh, treasurer of the World Bank, as a, co as a vice chair next to the vice chair of the IFRS Foundation's IASB board that joined me as the vice chair, Sue Lloyd, these are the group of people that work on that. So, and then we got everything checked by Carmen and his colleagues before they went final to ensure that all the words were assurable, that the, they, they could do their work. So, yes, the second part of the yes is we've embedded reliefs in the standards themselves. Mm -hmm. Scalability, proportionality, uh, uh, reasonable and supportable information, uh, no undue cost or efforts. Um, you, know, uh, you need to be uh, in compliance with and in accordance with the capacities of the company and the, the, uh, the exposure to the risk that you have. All sort of these information, the way, the, the way we, we, we did it. And the last thing I'd say, no, pre-last thing is, we, we need to come to this point that some of us were talking about and, and Carmen alluded to the fact that we need to update accounting. 80% mm. of the entries in accounting are estimates. Am I correct? Am I wrong? 70%? Yeah. Estimates. I mean, I've closed accounts of the multinational companies every year. They are never closed on the 31st of December. This is not true. We have pre-closes and we've got processes of adjustments and post-closings and all sorts of things, estimates. 80% well, I mean, of the balance sheets of large companies are intangible today, where they project the value, you know, the value of their acquisitions to the perpetuity growth of the cash flows. And so I'm simply saying we need to learn that new language and that's not going to be easy, but we need to create a safe place where people can start speaking the language. And the sooner we speak that language, the better we'll become at it. And obviously it will become more and more decision useful over time. I love this topic about the fact that we're just sort of like pulling some numbers from air. It's inherently uncertain how climate change will affect a business. So from an accounting point of view, I mean, the burden of proof is high, but the uncertainty is also high. Is there a legal liability? In this? Well, there's, there's going to be a legal liability almost on every estimate, you know, at some level. But, but here's, I think what Manuel was talking about is the concept of, quote, putting carbon on the balance sheet. Mm -hmm. So the adjusted EPS is a way to do that, but it's not. So we're, what we've been talking about is disclosure. Um, but the, the concept that we've been talking more about now more recently is is literally putting carbon on the balance sheet, meaning that carbon credits would be an, an asset and, and your emissions is a liability. Then you'd be able to tell whether companies are serious about where, what they're doing, and this would help your business a great deal. Um, but this is, you know, from our standpoint, it becomes risky because unless there's better carbon pricing, 
um, you know, this becomes totally. a, a real, a, a really mm -hmm. difficult estimate. Um, and so there would be liability with things like that. And, you know, there has to be some standards in some ways uh, of counting this. But to me, the more we can get the carbon pricing, and we were talking earlier, some people have internal carbon pricing and so forth. And at the Nolan, you probably had some something like that. Mm -hmm. But but the more we can make that standard, and the more we, I, I agree with, if we can get that on the balance sheet, that would, that would change a lot. Yeah. Um, so, so, Bonnie, how are you at the Hong Kong Exchange uh, tackling your own sustainability reporting? Forget the, the listed companies for a second. What about your own sustainability very reporting? Very difficult for me to forget I mean, them. is this something that you put with the, the, the Risk and Audit Committee, or has it moved into the C-suite? Oh, it has definitely, you know, moved into the C-suite and the board, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's a standing item, I would say. We talk about it a lot, and, and you know, we make a pledge that we will be... Um, uh, carbon neutral by next year, 2025. I need to be careful of the year we just change <laughs> into 2024. Uh, and I think the direction of travel for us, it's you know, very clear. And like I said, right, we wear multiple hats. We have to set an example and be a role model, you know, if we're going to sort of preach, you know, the climate disclosure and, and all this to our listed company. So uh, very much, you know, focused on it, mm. I would say. Uh, our commitment to sustainability, it's very firm. But but there's something that, you know, Emmanuel uh, mentioned, uh, which I wanted to react to if it's okay. Sure, please. So, so you know, you asked the question, first of all, is it doable? Mm. Uh, I think by our action of actually going out to a public consultation, we have already indicated, you know, our belief in what you are doing, right, which is very, very important. But it's, it's quite interesting when Emmanuel and Carmine explained the, the journey, their journey in terms of how it, it started with, you know, people around the table, right, these big corporates, you know, who has a lot of uh, knowledge in the subject uh, doing it. You know, listening to this and reflecting on the 10-year journey that, you know, we uh, went through as a regulator, I think the challenge is really how you dribble down. And we, you know, I asked you about the adoption guide earlier. You can have the global baseline, right? But the, the details, you know, the devil is really in the details as mm -hmm. we dribble down, you know, from the bigger and stronger global corporates to, you know, local, right? Yeah. And that's when we have to think about scalability facing in and how do we do it? And I spoke about, you know, HKEX, but we're, the, we're one of many, many regulators in Hong Kong. There are, you know, regula you know regulators you know, responsible for the insurance industry and the banking, you know, HKMA and all that. So what we do, I just want to share, right? We, we do have a cross-agency steering group in Hong Kong, and we talk about a lot of these coordination things so that we know, at least for our jurisdiction, everyone is pedaling, you know, in the same same direction, same pace and all that. We also talk about capacity building, right? Um, how do we build up the talent pipeline? Mm -hmm. uh, what our administration can do in terms of developing curriculum for the university so that we know down the road when there is broader adoption across the globe of these climate disclosure and, and adoption of these uh, or acceptance of this common standards that, that we have enough mm. talent to sustain the work which has been has to be done. Yeah. Yeah, so it's very clear that um, for companies these days, it's not external to the business strategy, is it, to think about things in terms of how am I going to be successful, how am I going to be resilient in the face of climate change, biodiversity loss, etc. So, so, Peter, I, what kind of trends are you seeing in terms of either new sectors, new companies, or new geographies that are coming to you and saying, I need a solution? I think the companies that have been the sort of at the cutting edge here uh, yeah. have been in primarily technology and finance, uh, at least in terms of pushing forward in sort of a semi-philanthropic way, pushing technologies down the cost curve. Companies like Google, for example, have a large team that works on deploying large amounts of, of uh, renewable energy. Uh, they've pushed forward things like hourly renewable energy credits that then sort of raise the standard for, for what it means to, to match renewable energy to actual uh, consumption. Um, so those are the sorts of companies that I think have been at the bleeding edge, broadly speaking, um, and now are have similarly been at the, at the bleeding edge of carbon removal. I think we've 
we've also seen a shift into financial services. Um, financial services are coming now to us looking for, for carbon removals and it's sort of spreading, spreading from there. Mm -hmm. Let me take it out to the audience now. Um, oh, excellent. We've got a question straight away. I love it. Okay, we'll bring over a microphone for you. If you'd like to um, state your name, your company, and who you would like to address the question to. Hello, um, I'm a global shaper from Istanbul. Uh, my name is Ira. Uh, I'm also a consultant at PwC and I work on the intersection of workforce and uh, climate change mm. as part of my job as well. <laughs> now I do climate change projects and I'm part of a great team of climate activists as part of the global shapers community. So I have experience from the activism side, from the regulation side, from the consulting side, and I also know about what the companies are needing. And what I saw in my collective experience is a big, big disconnect and misalignment between all these stakeholders. And I see that a big, big part of the problem is the companies are very worried about what they exactly need to do to comply or to change. Uh, and I see a solution in companies like your, yours. Mm. Uh, how do we bring these kind of solutions in companies and how do we connect you better with them? Do you have ISO standards? Are you compliant with that? Is that, that is a question that you should be asking to each other to better actually answer the needs of this ecosystem. So my question is that basically, how do we create better dialogue in this ecosystem and how do we bring better green entrepreneurs into this space to achieve realistic solutions mm. and impact? Very good question. Who would like to tackle that first? Peter. Peter. Yeah, I can, I can take a, a pass at that. Um, I actually don't think we're misaligned. We come at it from very different perspectives, yeah. but I don't actually feel misaligned with, uh, with this group. Uh, and what I mean by that is that if you look at the people who the customers, the corporates that are, are taking the biggest action, for example, take Microsoft. Microsoft is a huge purchaser of renewable electricity. They have a lot of AI stuff going on that they also want to offset. They also have pushed forward in a huge way in carbon removal uh, to drive that down the cost curve. And there haven't been standards, but they're very involved in, in helping figure out what they are through their actions and figuring out what those things, what those things actually are going to look like in practice. But I don't think that we can spread from the Microsofts of the world to the tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of other companies without the standards mm. that are being developed here, mm. right? So I think they play a very key role in helping the industry get started and helping figure out in practice what those things need to look like. But the work that these amazing folks are doing is what enables it to actually scale. I think your point about dialogue is important, and I, I'm going to throw it then to the, the panel as well. Um, who are the stakeholders? driving this and is there dialogue already between you? Well, maybe I can start. Please. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, we have multiple ways of organizing those dialogues. Uh, IOSCO is hosting a lot of them. They have, uh, so the International Organization of Stock Exchange Commissions, 135 of them. Um, they have, a, uh, for instance, a uh, Global Emerging Markets Committee, 120 jurisdictions. We are speaking regularly to them, engaging directly with those members, getting the feedback. We have a Sustainability Standards Advisory Forum with 13 different jurisdictions around the world, including a lot from the South that meet regularly to give us uh, input on those topics. We've got an investor in international advisory group of more than 200, and we're talking about trillions and trillions of investments, of course, that are talking to us very regularly as well. Uh, we have a jurisdictional working group that has, for instance, the SEC, the EU uh, uh, Commission, the UK, the Japan, China, Minister of Finance, now Singapore is joined and Chile is joined, that meets every month every month to discuss before our board meeting what are the important aspects, etc., etc. So I do believe that there is a tremendous amount of dialogue and of course all the dialogues that we've got with the accountancy profession and the assurance profession which is absolutely critical. So I, I, I would say none of that would be possible without much more even than dialogue but exactly what you say which is the interconnections yes. of the ecosystem all, all together. We, I didn't mention the stock exchanges for instance. The stock exchanges have a huge role to play. 
and we are directly connected to more than 60 of them. Also, I mean, the London Stock Exchange, for instance, of, of course, Hong Kong, Singapore, Tokyo Stock Exchange, that, you know, some of them are really seeing actually our standards as probably even enhancing their own business model because their market will be more transparent, less risky in terms of beta, and therefore attracting more capital. So it's a whole ecosystemic work. What, whatever will happen here won't happen without everyone taking their own share in, in, the, in the effort, I think. And before we move on to another question, Carmine or Bonnie, would you like to um, input to this as well? I, oh, go you go first. I, I was just going to add um, to, to, to both their comments, there has been and continues to be a lot of dialogue. I think the frustration is not around the dialogue, the frustration is around action and, and, and doing it. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's, that's been more the problem here. There's been a lot of dialogue for years. Um, Maybe and, too much and, dialogue. And we are where we are. Not enough action. And we've accomplished a lot, but, but it's, it's, people want to see action here. Yeah. I, I agree. The dialogue, you know, we have lots of it. I like the way Peter described it, which is that we're, we're just basically tackling the same problem from different perspective, okay? I mean, we, I believe we know there is a common goal here, right? It's decarbonization, right? But we each have our parts to play. Mm -hmm. Eventually, I, I hope, you know, things will converge and, and deliver the promise. Excellent. Thank you very much for kicking that off for us. Do we have other questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Doug Peters from, from S&P Global. I want to start by saying that Manuel was very modest at the beginning. What he's done is phenomenal, and he's been able to get much more done than anybody would have thought in 18 months, so congratulations on that. I had a conversation with somebody yesterday about the ISSB, which I'm a huge advocate of, that said that you haven't gone far enough or clear enough with the S or the social uh, dimensions of the reporting. I know we talk about ESG, and on this stage we've almost spent the entire time talking about climate, but I, I know I'm ans asking a question somebody else asked me, so I'm going back to that question, but what about the non-climate, non-environmental aspects of ISSP? So that's Please, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'll give it a try. Uh, thank you, Doug, for all of the support, by the way. Um, yeah, I wouldn't agree with that. Our general requirements, sustainability S1, says all risks and opportunities in sustainability needs to be reported. All. And they include impacts. Any impacts that may systematically or directly impact the prospect of the company need to be reported. And so that includes social, by definition. We have then developed a thematic standard on climate because that is probably the most complex, the most analytical, the most you know, um, monetized uh, possibility. But we will never be climate only. We are already climate first and we'll go to the next stage. In the meantime, we are basically saying any uh, information, if you have to report on a social topic, you can use the ESRS and filter them into the materiality of the prospects of a company. You can use GRI. We, this is referred to in S1 already. So, I, you know, we, we already have that coverage, but it is in a way outsourced to others filtered by our own filter when we do not have yet a thematic standard. The second thing I'd say, in the case of climate, we have developed an educational material that was ready even before and published before the standards got ready at the 1st of January this year that talks about just transition and the social aspects of the transition. Because, you know, we know that it's going to be either a roadblock or an enabler of the transition, the climate transition. And so the climate justice, the just energy transition, the accessibility, the affordability, the reskilling of workforce, how you restructure a mining operation when you close it, all of that needs to be part of what is going to be described in the climate uh, resilience plans of the, of the companies. So we are not complete, of course, but we do believe that we already have a lot to offer for people that want or we'd have to actually report on the social mm. side of things. Thank you for that. Do we have a last question? We've only got about six minutes left. If we've got a quick question, otherwise I've got a cheeky last question as well. Please, yes. Uh, oh, we've got a microphone for you. 
Thank you very much. I'm Alexander Betts from the University of Oxford. Um, really fascinating panel. Building on the last question about um, social sustainability metrics, I was also wondering about ways of thinking about the interconnection across these areas, environmental, social, and also where you see the SDGs um, as informing the future of sustainability metrics. Um, is there an interaction in how we think about reporting vis-a-vis -vis the SDGs, or are we leaving the SDGs behind? <laughs> Who would like to answer that? Resounding silence is quite well, a difficult I, I, I question. It's a little difficult. Please, yeah. I'll go. Um, I don't think the SDGs are behind. They are, they are you know, they're there. They're there. Uh, to me, it's very clear that the SDGs won't, uh, I'll be grand here for a minute, the SDGs won't be obtained if economy and finance don't do the hard lifting. I mean, government's money is catalytic but it doesn't have the amount that is needed for the transition. You know, the global capital markets are in total debt plus equity, 400 trillions. We're speaking about probably two trillions needed, four trillions needed for the transition. No government can pay for that every year, but that's only 1% of the total capitalization. So if the standards setting work here, the whole ecosystem can produce just 1% shift or 2% shift, every year of that into the transition, we will make it. And we won't make it without uh, sustaining at the end the SDGs. So I think the direction of travel is that you need public policies that are committed to these SDGs and you need well-informed capital markets to really be their ally in making sure that finance is funding the transition that the economies and, and, and the companies are doing to do in changing their own business models. I know you're only just trying to bed down the two new standards that we're talking about, but let's throw it forward. What's the next suite of standards that you may look to release? For example, human rights or something else? Well, the simple thing is uh, we never do anything without consulting. Mm -hmm. uh, so we are running huge consultation processes that take several months of re you know, receiving letters and, and comments and surveys. And then we take several months re-deliberating that in actually public sessions. All our board meetings are public uh, when we make our decisions. We've committed to, we, to the next part of the agenda already from scratch uh, the, the first day. And we have consulted on uh, four topics. One is biodiversity and ecosystem. The second is human capital and human rights. Uh, the third is about uh, uh, the uh, uh, integrated in, in uh, reporting. And uh, we are consulting on a fourth one. So we will really elaborate and be back uh, to the market about any a combination of all of that or I don't know yet because that's a decision that we need to make in terms of strategy and based on what the market tells us is more needed mm -hmm. uh, for the next two years of agenda uh, by the end of this uh, first half of the, of the year. So more to come on that. Okay, watch this space. We'll look forward to that. Let me just finish up. I mean, look, you know, we're here at Davos. We're hearing all about um, macroeconomic uncertainty. The problems on the geopolitical front seem to be heating up as well. There's a myriad of problems out there. You could really climb that wall of worry. Do you think mind that for companies they potentially risk losing focus on the importance of sustainability reporting because they are essentially as a business just trying to just survive in the face of all the things I mentioned um, this might be a controversial answer but absolutely yes mm -hmm. um, in fact I would even say that uh, in the US uh, we haven't talked about the US at all uh, and in the US I've seen companies lose some focus here uh, on, on sustainability, on disclosure. Um, now, if you talk to CEOs, they'll all say, no, 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 it's in everything we do every day. That's why we're not talking about it as much. I think there's been a little bit of a loss of focus. What do you think, Bonnie? I, I have a similar answer to the, the question. I think it's very difficult in the current environment for uh, business owners to sort of put a very high priority on this just because you know they're trying to survive. And I mentioned earlier, right, with the smaller companies and, you know, my listed uh, companies' population, they, they see this as a cost, okay? So, uh, you know, the more, more, more reason for them to want to deprioritize. But, you know, like I said, you know, the journey continues. We have to, we have to continue to, you know, pedal forward. Um, hopefully market conditions will improve and then, you know, we will get the new momentum. It's important to stay the course, isn't it? No matter how difficult. Yes. Let me conclude then, and Peter, you can kick it off for us. I'm gonna ask each of you, um, 
a more personal question in terms of what's the one thing that you would like to do personally or in your own business to, um, to sort of push this forward, to make a difference, essentially, in the sustainability reporting department? Uh, the number one thing that we're doing this year yes. is verifying with a third party the carbon removal that we put underground. Mm -hmm. So it will be verified by a third party who has no financial incentive to verify it, uh, that it did in fact go underground. Mm, that's very exciting. Yeah, and, and actually the most exciting part to me, I used to be a buyer of offsets, got very uh, disenchanted with how it was accounted for. The most important thing to me is that it will actually be fully public on the website, it actually already is, and you can go through the entire life cycle analysis like a FedEx delivery. Really? That level of detail and granularity is super important. Mm, thank you. What about you, Emmanuel? Oh, um, it's no news, uh, but it's a big thing for me. Uh, I was asked to consider um, renewing my mandate that's going to uh, finish uh, uh, at the end of this year, so that will be three years. So I agreed to uh, double down another three years. And so I'll be there for another four years in total. Well, thank you for your commitment. Thank you. Bonnie? Yes, uh, I mentioned it earlier. I, I do think that in order for all this to succeed, the, the human capital, the capacity building is indispensable. So on the one hand, I'm inflicting, you know, not inflicting, imposing, introducing uh, disclosure standards and whatnot on, on the listed companies I, I manage. I very much would wanna also do something to help them comply, right? So anything that, you know, I can do in my personal capacity to help build that pipeline, it's uh, worthwhile doing. And I'm sure as your new role of uh, incoming CEO, you'll be able to do that even better. Exactly. Come on, last lucky words. Yeah, so so mine's a little similar, um, and that is, and I mentioned it before as well, I would love for universities around the world to not only have an accounting degree, but every accounting degree comes with sustainability. You have dual degrees in accounting and sustainability, and that becomes the norm. Mm -hmm. uh, that would go a long way. It would go a long way for the accounting profession, because I think more and more kids would be interested in it. And it's something that I think some schools are starting, but it would be fabulous if we can get to that. That's a great note to end on. Thank you so much to our panel. Let's Thanks. give them a big warm applause.